I'm Ron Walls. I'm the Nesky Family Professor of Emergency Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and I had the pleasure of serving as Editor-in-Chief for the 10th edition of Rosen's Emergency Medicine Concepts in Clinical Practice. I am Susan Wilcox. I'm an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm Timothy Erickson. I'm Chief of the Division of Medical Toxicology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. What excites you about the new content in this edition of Rosen's? Not only have we gone through and rewritten all of the chapters, making them as evidence-based and up-to-date as possible, but we have added some new chapters to really focus on some of the special populations that we deal with in emergency medicine. We have a new chapter on care of the morbidly obese patient. We have a new chapter on coronaviruses, which we all know the importance thereof. We have really expanded our focus on the social determinants of health, which is an increasingly important issue in emergency medicine. The exciting things about this new edition are the format. It's very user-friendly. It's very consistent. There's new figures that are easy on the eye, easy to reference, up to 350 new figures. Uh, there are 24 to 25 video procedural um, options. For the first time, we used PharmDs to review all of the drugs in the book. What's the value of that? I don't know any other emergency medicine textbook that has had a PharmD, a pharmacy, a doctor team looking through each dose, each route of administration, the frequency to balance a very consistent recommendation throughout the textbook so you know when you're looking at a dose, a medication, and you're giving it to a patient, it has been vetted uh, by a, a pharmacist at the highest level. You were both working on the front line in the middle of the pandemic and you took time away from it to make this textbook come to life. How did you decide to do that? How did you find the time? was a sense of duty and of service. Uh, we still continued to work clinically, even while we were writing and editing chapters. Um, we did not want this to take our uh, duty away from the patient. If anything, it made it better because we were able to manage patients with evidence-based medicine, with the current recommendations, and I think it helped our patient care. Uh, there weren't enough hours in the day to take care of every patient and write every word in this book, but again, there was a sense of service and of mission to get this done on time, and the COVID pandemic just gave us even more motivation, not less. It wasn't a distractor, it was a motivator. Susan, you're one of those emergency medicine specialists who is also critical care trained and certified. So you were in the midst of this critical care aspect of COVID and yet you took time to edit this textbook work with the authors. How did you find that time? Editing Rosen's during the pandemic was truly a labor of love. It was critical to get the information out to people as quickly as we could without losing time with the pandemic. Working in the ICU and taking care of COVID patients who had been taken care of in the emergency department only a few moments or hours before made it that much more clear how important it is to take care of these patients appropriately and, and provide critical care up front in the emergency department. Once a patient gets to the ICU, often it's too late to start doing the right evidence-based things. And so this is why we know that emergency medicine is essential to improving the care of these patients, be it for COVID or any other critical illness. Tim and Susan, where's this specialty of emergency medicine going in the future and how does a book like Rosen's help us define that future. So I think through the pandemic and even as we're coming out of it, we've come to realize that the emergency department is truly in every way the safety net of our healthcare system. We re rely on the emergency department to provide emergency care and to provide care for patients who can't get it elsewhere. And as we evolve as a specialty, I think that taking care of these special populations, these vulnerable populations, will only become more important. And in this edition of Rosen's, we have really emphasized the care of patients who have uh, vulnerabilities 
thinking about the social determinants of health. And I think this will really shape the future of emergency medicine practice. What do you think? I agree. Um, this is the best time to be an emergency physician. It's an exciting time. We are on the front lines in social mm -hmm. determinants of health. We are the canary in the coal mine, the surveillance, the monitoring of what's going on in society, not only with infectious disease, like we talked about with the, the COVID pandemic, but behavioral health, mm -hmm. trauma, uh, obstetrical emergencies, pediatrics. There's so many specialties that present through the portal of the healthcare system, and that's emergency medicine. So for those going into it and learning this specialty with a foundational textbook, there's no better time than now to be an emergency physician. I've been in emergency medicine long enough to remember the controversy over screening for domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I remember the controversy over reporting child abuse. Mm -hmm. And now in this new edition of Rosen's, we have a discussion of human trafficking. How does that sort of work that we're doing now help our providers, our learners, prepare themselves for the reality of the world as we now face it? Well, one of the, the important aspects of knowing more about sexual trafficking in marginalized, marginalized patients is that you think about it. And in by doing this textbook, I didn't write the chapter on sex trafficking or marginalized patients, but I did review it. And it helped me clinically because I went into the patient's room with an increased sense that could this be domestic violence? Could this be community-based violence? Could this be internationally-based violence? And without these chapters, I wouldn't have thought about that walking into the room. So it's even changed me as an editor in my clinical practice. I completely agree. One of the strengths in emergency medicine is that we are the intersection between acute care and public health. And so being able to, to consider the other issues our patients are, are dealing with that they may be at risk for will help us become better stewards of the public health and to better advocate for our patients. When you were a resident, what were you most afraid of when you were working clinically? As a resident, I was most afraid of doing the wrong thing. I was very concerned that a patient would come in for whom I, I did not know what the diagnosis was and that I would do something that would harm the patient. And so one of the things that I did to mitigate that was hit the books. And I, I studied and read. And I would read about patients after my shift, look up things that I didn't know on shift, so the next time I would know them. I would read uh, empirically things that I, I was afraid of seeing, things that I, I felt like I was very uncomfortable with. And one of the key sources that I used was Rosen's. Because I knew that I could trust that information. I knew that it had been written by not just my attendings, but you know attendings across the country who were experts in this material. I knew that I could find the information that I needed to improve my patient care. Tim, what were you most afraid of when you were working clinically as a resident? As a resident, uh, lots of things. Uh, one of them is the sick child. Uh, fortunately for society, we don't see a lot of sick children, really sick children, but when you do, you have to act quickly. And that probably put the biggest fear of God into me is trying to resuscitate a child in front of his or her parents and not succeeding. This textbook has pediatric emergency medicine experts, the finest in the field, writing these chapters. That is one thing I commonly hear, not even out of residency, just in clinical practice in the community, is the sick child. We cover that. The other thing I feared as a resident, and even as an attending in a teaching hospital, is procedures. Do you do enough of them? When's the last time you've put in a Minnesota tube or a Blakemore tube? Susan probably puts in more in the intensive care unit than I do. Uh, but those rare procedures, and this book, Changing with the Times, has video clips that are accessible, I believe 24 or 25 of them that go through 
common procedures, but maybe not so common in your practice. You may do them one or two times a year. That's the other thing I feared the most as a resident was failing that central line. Ron, you've seen residents come and go. You've seen the next generation of residents coming in. Maybe they're getting trained differently, some the same. But what advice would you give to the resident entering this field at a time where they're in debt, they fear burnout, overcrowding, and they're thinking, did I make the right decision going into emergency medicine? So emergency medicine is one of those amazing fields where you actually go home every day knowing you made a difference. That's the remarkable thing about it. And I think that's one of the things that combats burnout. The other is really knowing what you're doing. So my advice to residents today would be learn the specialty. Learn it in depth. Learn the patterns behind the diseases, but learn about the diseases themselves. Understand why things happen to people the way they do and get really, really good at it. Because if you learn the specialty well, you're equipped, you're confident, you know you're the go-to person when that patient comes in with whatever they come in with, and you're ready for that. And I think being ready for that is such a good immunization against burnout because it makes you feel like you can do what you need to do, you can help the patient, and the stress that's on you is so much less because you know what you're doing. Uh, be proud of the fact you've chosen this field. It's evolving. Um, when it started, it wasn't necessarily respected amongst the other specialties. We're one of the younger ones. But now people know, we know the orthopedic surgeons, we know the trauma surgeons, we know the internists, the pediatricians, the obstetricians, dermatologists, anesthesiologists, ENT, ophthalmology, I could go on and on. We know everyone in the hospital. We are the portal of the hospital. More and more, those specialties are sending their patients to us intentionally because they know 24-7, 365, those patients are going to get great care. There's a sense of pride and what I'm seeing in emergency medicine because of that special relationship with the entire hospital staff, nursing, administration, our emergency medicine physicians are becoming the leaders of healthcare throughout the system. Uh, very proud of that fact. If you look at the deans of colleges, the COOs, the CEOs, the hospital presidents, not just the chairs, they're emergency physicians. And there's a reason behind that. So you're going into a vibrant field that's needed. You will have a job. <laughs> and it'll be a job you can be very, very proud of. And you can take anywhere, urban, rural, suburban, global, austere, not many specialties can brag about that, but we can be proud of it. <laughs>